In this video, I'm going to cover colligative properties. Colligative properties are those whose value depends only on the number of solute particles and not on what kind of particle they are. So um, this is kind of counterintuitive because the idea is it doesn't matter if I put in polar solute particles or nonpolar solute particles. It doesn't matter what the chemical nature of those solute particles is. All that matters is how many of them there are. And so certain properties of a solution, um, these colligative properties, are those whose uh, value does not depend on whether the particles are polar or nonpolar. It just depends on how many of them there are. So it depends on the concentration of the solution, the number of solute particles in the solvent. Vapor pressure is one example of a colligative property. So um, addition of a solute to a solvent causes that solvent to have a lower vapor pressure. And so we can kind of see why that would be down here in these images of water. So um, pure water molecules are stuck together by intermolecular forces. The hydrogen bonds uh, between water molecules, and remember when they're uh, in pure water, those particles can get really close to each other. And so on average, each water molecule has four hydrogen bonds. It's capable of accepting two hydrogen bonds and donating two hydrogen bonds. So um, the, the number of particles that are able to escape the liquid phase into the gas phase is a function of how tightly held those liquid particles are when they're um, held by all those hydrogen bonds. So the stronger the intermolecular forces, the fewer gas particles will be able to escape. They'll, they'll be stuck, the particles are sticky. So um, when I add a solute, what happens is that um, these, the solute disrupts the network of water molecules. They can't pack together as tightly anymore. And in this case, um, when we put in a solute, the solute actually creates forces on the water molecules that are even stronger um, in the case of uh, non-volatile solutes like ionic compounds. So if I were to put an ionic compound in water like sodium chloride, I would be replacing the hydrogen bonds that each water molecule had with ion dipole forces. So those ions are kind of even stickier than the water molecules are so the water molecules now have to break not only hydrogen bonds between each other, but they also have to shed these ionic ion dipole forces in order to escape the liquid phase into the gas phase. So um, addition of a non-volatile solute reduces the rate of vaporization. And so non-volatile meaning that um, if we put in a compound like a liquid, an, an another liquid with the water, then the liquid itself has a vapor pressure and um, two liquids mixing together is going to have a different effect on the vapor pressure than if we put in a non-volatile solute, so something like a solid. So in this case it doesn't actually matter whether it's ionic, like we were talking about, or if it's uh, um, covalent. So if it's a compound that, that doesn't have any charged particles in it, this effect would still happen. So, and that's true of all colligative properties. Regardless of what kind of particle we put in the solution, these same effects are going to happen. So um, what happens uh, when I have a solution that has some solute particles in it um, is that this effect on vaporization, uh, the vapor pressure, is going to uh, create what we call a thirsty solution. So a solution that has solute particles dissolved in it, we just saw this, is going to have a lower vapor pressure. So those solute particles are going to disrupt the intermolecular forces between the water molecules, and they're going to make the water molecules uh, more difficult for them to escape into the gas phase. So what that means is that over here there are going to be fewer particles in the gas phase and any particles in the gas phase that happen to get close to this 
liquid down here are going to get stuck. This water, this solution over here, is stickier to the gas particles than the pure water is. It's stickier in the sense that fewer of them can escape, and when the gas particles get close, they get stuck. So what that means is that over time, this um, solution over here, or this, this would be pure solvent, I suppose this is just the water, the pure solvent is going to evaporate at a faster rate than the solution is. And so more of these particles are going to be in the gas phase. And as they are in the gas phase and they eventually diffuse and randomly move around the uh, volume until they get into this beaker, then once they get close enough to the solution, they're going to get pulled in and they're going to get stuck in that solution. And some of these gas particles are going to go over this way and they're going to get stuck in this solution, but fewer of them. So what that means is on average, particles are going to move from this beaker over into this beaker. And that's what we see if we leave these two beakers uh, in, in the same closed environment for a while, then the particles on average are going to move from this beaker over to this beaker. And then some equilibrium will be reached and the level in this beaker will be higher and the level in this beaker will be lower. So we can express this relationship mathematically uh, and we call that Raoult's law. So the vapor pressure of a volatile solvent above a solution is equal to its normal vapor pressure, which we would call P naught, multiplied by its mole fraction in the solution. So uh, the vapor pressure of the solvent in the solution equals the mole fraction of the solvent times the normal vapor pressure, uh, P naught. So because the mole fraction is always less than one, the vapor pressure of the solvent in the solution will always be less than the vapor pressure of the pure solvent. All right, because remember when we, we calculated uh, mole fraction in the last section, and the mole fraction of the solvent plus the mole fraction of the solute always equals one. And so th this value will always be less than one. So we'll be always be multiplying the vapor pressure by some number that's less than one. So this will be smaller. So um, when both the solvent and the solute can evaporate, if they're both liquids, for example, then both molecules will be found in the vapor phase. So this was a situation that we were talking about before where um, if, if, the, if the solvent is water, for example, and the solute is another liquid like ethanol, um, then both of those compounds have a vapor pressure. Molecules of H2O are escaping from that solution and molecules of ethanol are also escaping from that solution. So um, we can calculate the pressure of the whole system, the total vapor pressure. The total vapor pressure above the solution is equal to the sum of the vapor pressure of the solute and the vapor pressure of the solvent. They're just added together. So for an ideal solution, that's the case. The total pressure equals the pressure of the solute plus the pressure, the vapor pressure of the solvent. The vapor pressure decreases the solute vapor pressure in the same way the solute decreased the solvents. So the pressure of the solute equals the uh, mole fraction times the um, pressure of the solute. So this will be affected by how much solute there is. And the pressure of the solvent equals the mole fraction of the solvent times, times its normal pressure. So if there's more of this, if the mole fraction of the solvent is higher, then um, the, this will be affected less. In ideal solutions, the made solute-solvent interactions are equal to the sum of the broken solute-solute and solvent-solvent interactions. So remember, when we're talking about the energetics of making a solution, th um, the steps that have to occur are the solute molecules. We have to break the bonds between the solute particles. We have to break the bonds between the solvent particles, and then we make bonds between solute and solvent. So step one and step two take energy. It takes energy to break bonds. So step one and step two are endothermic.
But step three, mixing them together and making those bonds, that's exothermic. So remember, we talked about um, whether or not if step one and step two take more energy than is released in step three, then overall that process is endothermic and overall that process would be cold, the beaker would feel cold. But if I get more energy back, if step three releases more energy than is absorbed in step one and two, then the process is exothermic and the beaker feels hot. So in an ideal solution, step the, the energy that's required to break these apart, step one and step two, is exactly equal to the energy that I get back in step three. So the, the beaker wouldn't change temperature at all. It would be exactly the same. So that's what we call an ideal solution, one that's not, that wouldn't be hot or cold. Step one and step two are equal to step three. So if the solute-solvent interactions are stronger or weaker than the broken interactions, so if step three is either greater than or less than step one and two, then we say that that kind of solution is non-ideal. So these are some vapor pressure curves of solutions that are ideal and solutions that are not ideal. So here's an example of um, the vapor pressure of uh, component A and component B if we're talking about a solution that's made of two, um, a mixture that's made of two components. So the way that we read this chart is that this is the mole fraction down here, the mole fraction of some component, say component A. So over here, there is zero amount of A. So what's the vapor pressure of A when there's zero A? It's zero. And uh, when I increase the amount of A there is, as the mole fraction of A increases, then we see that the vapor pressure of A increases. And when there's 100% A, mole fraction is one, that means 100%, then A has this value of vapor pressure. So if um, the mole fraction of A is 100% here, and we're talking about a mixture, and this is the curve for B, then the value of B at this point is zero. If I have 100% A, then I have 0% B. And over here on this side, if I have 0% A, then I have 100% B. So we could write on this side, just so we can kind of see what's happening. This would be X, B, and it would be 100%, it would just be the opposite, 100 all the way down to zero. So over on this side, I have 100% B, so this is the vapor pressure when I have 100% B, and as I start to decrease the amount of B, I go this way, B goes down, 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 until I get to zero B. And when I have 0B, I have 100A. So right here at 0.5, this is 50% A and 50% B. So if I'm going to make a vapor pressure, this is how the vapor pressure responds. Um, this is the vapor pressure of A, and this is the vapor pressure of B. So the vapor pressure of the solution is just um, a diagonal line that meets these points, and I can say that it kind of, it's kind of halfway between A and B. So when I have 50% A and 50% B right here in the middle, then the vapor pressure of the solution is right here on this line. When I have 100% of B, that's right here, the vapor pressure of the solution matches the vapor pressure of B. Right? You can see how these lines come together. The purple line and the blue line come together right here. That's because the purple line is made of A and B together, and but the A is running out. And right here, the A is running out, it's running out, it's running out, the A is gone. So the B, is this is just pure B, when there's no A, then, a, then B and the solution look exactly the same. And we can say the same thing over here. This is 0% A, but I'm getting more and more and more. More A, more A, this is 100% A right here. So the vapor pressure of the solution looks exactly like A when I have 100% A. When I have 99% A, the vapor pressure of the solution is pretty close. When I have 98% A, 
the vapor pressure is getting a little bit further away. 90% A, starting to deviate a bit more. 80% A, now the it's, it's deviating a bit more. So you can see how the vapor pressure of the solution is A plus B, the purple line and the blue line mixed. So this is an ideal solution, an ideal solution where the intermolecular forces between the solvent and the solute are exactly the same. So that's very rare for that to happen. We're talking about um, having a compound like H2O that has four hydrogen bonds, and we'd have to put in another compound that, had, that was capable of making four hydrogen bonds to water molecules in exactly the same way that other, mole other water molecules do. That's, that's pretty rare for that to happen. If we put in another particle that's very similar to H2O, it's still not going to be exactly the same. So those forces aren't going to be exactly the same. So an ideal solution doesn't really exist. All solutions are going to be a l are going to have forces that are slightly different, a little bit stronger or a little bit weaker than the forces in the pure solvent. So, here's what those curves look like for non-ideal solutions when the intermolecular forces between solvent and solute are not exactly the same. So, these red lines are the hydrogen bonds. So, a water molecule here if I have just pure water, there's four hydrogen bonds. But if I have a solution, then one of these water molecules is gone. So if I have a solution that has ions in it, now these uh, this is an ion dipole force. So the ion dipole force here between the water molecules and the ion is even stronger than a hydrogen bond. So this, this is a strong solute-solvent interaction, even stronger than, than the bonds in pure water. So the vapor pressure of the solution is going to be lower than we would otherwise expect because the, those particles are sticky. The water particles are now stuck to that ion, so they can't escape. So if they can't escape, then the vapor pressure is going to be lower than we would expect for an ideal solution for a solution that has weak solute-solvent interaction. So if we replace the particle in the middle with something that's less polar, um, so something like CH4, which wouldn't really be soluble in water in the first place. But if we put something in there that these forces would be dipole-dipole or dispersion, the forces between the water molecules and the solute, would be weaker than hydrogen bonds. If that's the case, then the vapor pressure of the solution is going to be even greater than we would expect. And that makes sense because this particle, CH4, is going to have a very high vapor pressure because it only has dispersion. So these particles aren't very sticky. So they're not going to be very sticky to water. And so the vapor pressure of that solution is going to be greater than we would expect for an ideal solution. So another colligative property is called freezing point depression and boiling point elevation. So um, a solution uh, has a lower freezing point than a pure solvent, and it also has a higher boiling point than a pure solvent. So adding a, sol a solute to a solvent seems to stabilize the liquid, the liquid state, because um, the the freezing point goes down, so it's going to be liquid even colder than it otherwise would be, and the boiling point goes up, so it's going to be a, it's going to boil later, so it's going to be a liquid for even longer than we think that it otherwise would be. So adding a solute to a solvent, um, in making those part of those solvent solute interactions seems to stabilize the solvent and stabilize the liquid form. So we can see that here in a phase diagram where the liquid, the liquid region is getting bigger. Look, it's, it's pulled down this way into the gas. It would, it would be a gas, but now it's, a, it's still a liquid. And here it would be a solid, but it's getting pulled into the solid region. So the liquid part gets bigger. So when we add solute, and we can see that with the vapor pressure too, it seems to pull those 
particles back into the solution. So adding a solute stabilizes a liquid. We could quantify that um, with this freezing point depression equation. So uh, the, the change in temperature, so if the freezing point was zero degrees Celsius, and then I add a solute, some salt, and now the freezing point is negative five degrees Celsius of that solution, I've decreased the freezing point. So the change in freezing point, delta T, is equal to the molality times the freezing point depression constant. So um, if we know what the, how, what the freezing point um, change is, the change in freezing point, then we can calculate what the concentration of the solution is in molals, because this is a constant. We'll just look it up in a table. And conversely, if I know what the concentration is, the molality of the solution, and I look this up in a table, then I can, con I can calculate what the uh, freezing point is going to be decreased to, what, it what the new freezing point will be after I um, add a solute to the solvent. Here are some values of uh, freezing point depression and boiling point elevation constants. So here's a table where you would find these values of Kf, the freezing point depression, if we're talking about the change in freezing point, or we have to use a different constant if we're talking about the change in um, boiling point, if we're talking about boiling point elevation. So for the same compound, for benzene, it has two different constants depending on whether we're calculating freezing point depression or boiling point elevation. So the boiling point elevation calculation is the same as the freezing point depression. The change in the boiling point, it was the boiling point of, of pure water is 100. I add a whole bunch of salt to it. Now the boiling point of that solution is 105 degrees Celsius. So the change in boiling point is five degrees. That's equal to the molality times the boiling point constant times Kb that we look up on a table. Another colligative property is osmosis. And um, we've talked about this before. Osmosis is the flow of solvent from a solution of low concentration to a solution of high concentration. The solutions may be separated by a semi-permeable membrane. So um, the, we can calculate the, osmo the osmotic pressure, which is um, denoted with this capital pi, uh, by multiplying the molarity times the gas constant times the temperature of the solution. So let's talk about osmosis. Osmosis is when I have pure water on one side of a solution or pure solvent and I have a solution on the other side and in between those two sides is a semi-permeable membrane. And semi-permeable means some things can get through and other things can't. So only water only the pure solvent is capable of passing through the membrane. The, the big particles, the solute particles, cannot go through the membrane. So um, osmosis is the tendency of uh, a solvent to want to equalize the concentration on both sides of that membrane. So here, the concentration of water is 100%, but over here, the concentration of water is lower because I ha it's a mixture. It has these blue particles that are in the way. So the tendency of the water is to um, more, the water wants to go this way. The water goes from where there's uh, pure water to where there's a mixture of water so that it can dilute the solution and try to get more water particles over here and crowd the blue particles out. And uh, um, the tendency is to try to equalize the solution, although the solution will never become equal because there will always be some solute particles on this side and there will never be any on this side. So the water is always trying to move this way to, to um, equalize that concentration. But at some point, so much water has moved through the barrier that it's raised the level of the liquid relative to this side very high. And then there's a pressure because this, this side weighs more than this side does. 
So that pressure is pushing down on the water, and there's also the pressure of the water pushing this way, trying to equalize the concentration. And that difference is what we call the osmotic pressure. So um, sometimes when we look at these freezing point depression and boiling point elevation um, equations, there's also another, another uh, variable in there. So we have delta Tf, the freezing point depression, equals I times the molality times Kf. And this I is called a Van't Hoff factor. And the Van't Hoff factor is um, a way that we can quantify the tendency of ions to not fully separate in a solution. So when I have a solution of potassium chloride, what we've seen so far is that in that solution, the potassium and the chloride are separated because the water molecules are surrounding each ion. And that's true to the most, for the most part. But to some extent, and de it depends on the specific ions that we're talking about, but to some extent, ions like to pair up like this, even in a solution. So rather than them being completely separated, the water particles would be surrounding a KCl ion pair. So if the particles completely separate, then the theoretical Van Hoff factor is the ratio of molecules to, um, of solute particles to the moles of formula units dissolved. So um, one formula unit of KCl makes two particles, one K and one Cl. Um, so when we're talking about ionic compounds that break apart, then we have to uh, account for the number of particles in solution. So one KCl formula unit actually has two particles, a K and a Cl. So when we're talking about uh, osmotic pressure, um, osmosis is a force that is very important when we're talking about cells because a cell membrane is like a semi-permeable me membrane. Water can pass through the cell membrane, but solutes cannot freely pass through the cell membrane. So um, osmotic force comes into play, osmotic pressure comes into play when we're talking about the nature of uh, the concentration of solutes inside of cells. So a hypoosmotic solution is one that has a lower osmotic pressure than the solution inside of the cell. So as a result, there is a net flow of water into the cell, causing it to swell. So when the solution, when the concentration of solutes outside of a cell is greater than the concentration of solutes inside of the cell, then that causes water to move away, it causes water to move toward the solute. So when there's a greater amount of solute outside of the cell, for example, if a person drinks seawater, if, if a person drinks salt water and they're, they're trapped on the ocean and they, they have no other means of water, so if you drink a lot of salty water, this is what happens to your cells because the water outside of your cells becomes so salty, more salty than the water inside the cells, so the water inside the cells tries to dilute the salt. So all the water inside your cells leaves the cell, it goes toward the solute, and your, sh your cells shrivel up. That's called, oops, that's called hy hyperosmotic, H-Y-P-E-R, hyperosmotic. Hypoosmotic is the opposite solution the opposite uh, uh, situation where um, maybe in this case we've drank we drank pure ocean water so lots very very salty water but in this case maybe we drank distilled water that didn't have any salt in it at all it was pure H2O well in that case the opposite situation occurs where I have um, salty water inside the cells and less salty water outside the cells so where's the water gonna go the water goes toward the salt so it's gonna go inside the cells and that causes the cells to, to swell to the point where they might actually burst uh, because they have too much water on the inside. So the idea is that the solution on the outside of the cell has to have some salt and the solution on the inside of the cell has to have some salt and that amount of salt should be pretty much balanced so that the flow of water happens equally f inside the cell and to the outside of the cell so that your cells uh, don't get too shriveled up and don't get too swollen. 